He's just, you know, kind of looking side to side, but uh, not really doing anything. If you know there's bad guys out there and you know there's shooting going on, the first thing you're gonna do is at least just change direction. Hi, I'm Matt Zeman. I'm an instructor with the Air Force's Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base. I've been a pilot for 26 years. Today, we'll be looking at World War II dogfight scenes from movies to determine how real they are. We actually did get a couple of airplanes airborne, and uh, I mean, those are all amazing stories. The guys that are loosely depicted in this scene, Welch and Taylor, they were out partying the night before an uh, all-night poker game, and they had just gone to bed like about an hour beforehand. They heard the bombs going off. They were still wearing tuxedo pants. They jumped in a car going about 100 miles an hour, getting shot at along the way. True story. So if you've got a plane chasing another one in level flight, those bullets are gonna be shooting out way ahead. They're not gonna be splashing down in the water right in front of it. Competition aerobatic planes and, you know, modern fighters can kind of do a knife edge pass like that, but, uh, you know, a P-40 couldn't do that. If you're on its side flying through a, basically a canyon of, of buildings like that, uh, you're, you're, you're gonna end up flying into the buildings. The Japanese did fly extremely low, so, uh, I guess there's some realism there. There were multiple accounts of guys seeing planes that were either scraping the belly fuel tank or, uh, uh, you know, scraping the, the tips of their propellers. Welch and Taylor and the other guys that actually did get in dogfights were up at higher altitudes, not flying at treetop level. Danny, I still got three on my tank. Come on, come on now! So mid airs do happen in air combat when you got a lot of planes flying around the sky, but to have that kind of coordination, you know, do a head on pass and, and you know, cut right at the last second so that the, the zeros would fly into each other is uh, quite a bit of fiction. <laughs> yeah, um, so that's one thing that I think Hollywood uh, pretty often gets wrong in showing uh, just this unlimited firepower. It's limited to begin with, which is why you fire short bursts. You don't waste your ammunition. Or Welch and Taylor uh, didn't even have a full load of their guns when they got airborne. Come on. It looks like a kid in an arcade game uh, with both hands on the stick, you know, going left and right. You don't do that. Uh, your left hand's on the throttle. The only time you really use both hands on the stick is, you know, if you're pulling back and kind of a brake turn. I give it about a four. Enemy fighters, 11 o'clock! We got company! Using a, a hand microphone like that, if you're not wearing an oxygen mask that has a microphone in it, uh, guys would wear a throat mic so that uh, it would kind of pick up the vibrations in your vocal cords. And if you think about it, you fly an airplane with your right hand, you're definitely not uh, going to have time in the middle of combat to pick up a a microphone and talk into it and put it back and then take control of the airplane. That's uh, completely unrealistic. We'd call that a snapshot. You know, it's just kind of a, a quick target of opportunity as, as bad guys pass in front of you. The uh, SBD Dauntless, it's a scout dive bomber, but actually did pretty good air to air. It had a, about a three to one kill ratio. So it actually shot down three enemy airplanes for every uh, Dauntless that got shot down by an enemy airplane. So there's two kinds of enemy fire against aircraft. There's barrage fire, which are, are flak, uh, which are shells that explode at kind of a predetermined altitude. And then there's kind of the aimed fire, you know, typical machine gun. The flak is those black bursts that are happening. And those bursts are following all the way down the die. That's not terribly realistic. You know, that would be kind of blanketing a certain altitude. And then you would have the machine gun fire that would be, you know, tracking the guy through the dive. He's releasing later than they, they really would. So you'd roll into that near vertical dive and, and uh, typically release the bomb at about 2,000 feet um, to recover around 500 feet. The reason they do dive bombing is because if you're in a level dive and you, you know, drop a, drop a bomb, there's a lot of error that can happen. The steeper your dive is, the more you're basically just dropping straight down. It, it minimizes a lot of those, those errors. Because they're in that vertical dive, you don't want that bomb to be uh, going right through your propeller arc and, uh, and hit your blade. So they had a little trapeze. When you would release the bomb, it would swing the bomb outside of the, the diameter of the propeller arc uh, to, to be clear of the aircraft. He does a decent job of kind of showing the G-forces as you pull out from a dive. You're, you're pulling pretty aggressively there. Mm -hmm. 
trying to you know hide in the clouds that is a, a fairly valid tactic you can't really see in the cloud so uh disappear into the cloud maybe fly around a little bit pop out a different side and hope that the bad guy doesn't find you and same for the zero to just be right at that point in time as he comes out of the cloud to be right in a shooting position a little unrealistic The idea to you know kind of haul back with both hands is pretty accurate some guys would even black out call it g lock g induced loss of conscious but the idea was hey if if i'm still holding back on the stick the nose is is going up so i'm at least you know flying away from the ground and you know even if i pass out or release the stick the blood flow will start coming back and and i'll wake up but uh but yeah that defies the laws of physics you know to to release it you know about 200 feet there and and uh, recover just skimming the deck of the carrier That guy out in the water, that's uh, Ensign George Gay. He was the only guy to survive from his squadron. The entire squadron got shot down, but he watched the entire battle of Midway bobbing in the water there uh, and was eventually rescued, but uh, quite, a, quite a witness to history. So he's jinking there, which are, you know, doing kind of rapid changes in direction so the gunners can't track you. Easiest way to get killed is just fly in a straight line and be a predictable target. But you would not fly straight at an enemy ship like that and <laughs> fly right at the guns. I'd give this about a three and a half. Very accurate. The The Brits operated in a what they called a three-ship Vic, uh, at least early in the war. And the idea was the two guys on the wings just follow the leader and uh, you know he focuses on the target once they engage then everybody you know can start firing but for this time period that's extremely accurate if anything they might be a little bit wider so they're not uh, just you know close formation the whole time Jack fuel for this one and two very accurate for Lee to ask for a fuel check. The wingmen uh, burn more gas than Lee does, so Lee's making sure that they've got enough gas. And the Spitfire didn't hold a lot, uh, just a little bit over an hour of flight time. So to take off from an airfield in, in uh, southeast England and get over to the French coast, uh, you didn't have a whole lot of play time before you'd have to, have to come back. So very accurate consideration there. Keep a feel, they'll come out of the sun. That's still a valid tactic today where, you know, try to get the sun behind you because it's really difficult to see from World War I until now. That is still, a, you know, a, a dominant tactic to, to try and, you know, come out of the sun. The only downside out of this one is uh, you're not terribly effective patrolling down at, you know, wave top level below 500 feet. Normally these guys are going to be up uh, quite a bit higher, you know, 10,000 feet, maybe even higher. Spitfire doesn't carry a whole lot of ammo. You're pretty limited. So you want to do short bursts of about two seconds or so. So he's doing a good job there. He's missing the target though, because he's not leading it. To hit a point in space, you've got to shoot out ahead of it so that you know the bullets and the target meet at the same point in time. Clip. Bad guys don't always just explode into a ball of flames. And it's pretty common, you know, if you damage the engine or the flight controls, it'll just kind of be a, a gradual descent as opposed to, you know, the airplane just exploding or a wing coming off. So cool shot. A little unrealistic, you know, our, uh, our, our fearless Spitfire pilot has run out of gas, which is not inaccurate for the uh, amount of fuel the Spitfire carried and, you know, if you're engaged in combat over the coast. Planes do glide, you know, once the engine is out, uh, Spitfire can go about two miles for every uh, thousand feet of altitude. And I'd say he's at about a thousand feet, so he can maybe go two miles. So at that altitude, he's got probably less than a minute. That's a Stuka dive bomber, and the Stuka actually have uh, sirens installed on them. They were air, uh, air powered that makes that very distinctive sound, and they use that for psychological purposes. But it's funny how, you know, any movie will show just about any kind of airplane that's in a dive will be making that screaming sound. To turn around and engage a fighter, you're bleeding energy any turns that you make, and you're you're just you're going down quicker. So the ability to turn back, shoot a guy, and then turn back down the beach, it's a little bit of a stretch. 
I mean, the guns work regardless. So, uh, so theoretically, yes, it is possible to uh, to shoot a guy down, you know, with the engine off. Um, famous fighter pilot Robin Olds got a kill in World War II. He uh, he forgot to switch fuel tanks, and right when he was lined up on a bad guy, and and uh, so the engine quit, but he was in a shooting position. He took the shot. He he uh, he shot down the bad guy, and then switched his fuel tanks, and and was back in business. <laughs> You'd want to torch the plane so it doesn't fall in enemy hands. The Spitfire was, you know, Britain's most advanced fighter at the time, and you never want to let that technology fall into enemy hands so they can, you know, either reverse engineer it or figure out how to negate the Spitfire's advantages. So definitely, uh, that was pretty realistic to to torch the plane. We still do that these days. It just looks like the propellers on a stick mounted to the rest of the plane. It ignores this entire, you know, V12 metal engine block that would be uh, filling up that space. So. You were so close. Yeah, I'd say overall, I'd probably give Dunkirk about a 7.5. There's a lot that's really good. Love the fact that they use real airplanes. Here we go, Lightning. Right Red Tails talks about the Tuskegee Airmen. It was an all African-American uh, fighter group. An amazing story. They trained right here in Alabama, and uh, due to segregation at the time, they they had to fight really two battles. There was the battle against the Germans, and there was the battle against segregation and, and racism. So the fact that the guy's flying straight and level, he knows there's fighters out there, and he's just, you know, kind of looking side to side, but uh, not really doing anything. You're just a sitting duck. The easiest way to be a target is flying a, a straight line. So if you know there's bad guys out there and you know there's shooting going on, the first thing you're going to do is at least just change direction so you're not a predictable target. Nine o'clock low! Nine o'clock low! Planes don't do kind of little hockey stops like that, uh, rolling in behind somebody. These jets ain't nothing. The Mustangs are keeping up with the, the jets, which is completely unrealistic. More speed. Let's get some altitude. Gaining altitude to be able to get, uh, you know, more of a energy differential was was pretty common, but you wouldn't do it uh, just by doing a loop right there. You're you're trading in that uh, kinetic energy for that potential energy. So ideally, if you see the enemy from a distance, you're able to maneuver and start kind of a gentle climb so you get up above them. I'd give Red Tails a, a three. The only redeeming value is telling the story of the Red Tails, which is a uh, is an important story to tell. Bombardier to pilot your ship. Roger. So the bombardier is actually flying the airplane on the bomb run. When he's got control with the uh, with the gun sight, the corrections, the the gun sight's basically you know flying the plane on autopilot. And so no matter what the uh, the bombardier is doing, that will actually you know steer the aircraft. And uh, the bombardier's got control on the bomb run. Uh oh. Zero inbound. Ten o'clock level. When he called zero ten o'clock, that was a uh, you know accurate clock position. Sometimes in movies they'll they'll call a clock position you know like enemy fighters three o'clock and they're looking to the left side, but three o'clock is off to your right. So head-on attacks were not uncommon. They would actually fly kind of in a wall, inverted, uh, to get as close to the bomber as possible, and then you know use gravity to your advantage. So you could you know pull back on the stick and you just dive away. And the Japanese did that as well because they knew that the the front side of the bomber was the the least defended. So there you see kind of the catastrophic hit. Sometimes it's it's just a matter of uh, you know hitting a, a fuel tank on the wing or hitting the engine or maybe even just killing the pilot uh, where you don't necessarily get that uh, pretty big fireball. So overall, this is a, a pretty accurate clip. I'd say they do a pretty good job with this. I'd probably give it a, a nine. You see the brass uh, shell casings coming out of the wings. That's pretty realistic. A lot of people don't think, and they just think about the bullet coming out of the barrel, but not all the brass that's uh, that's uh, getting expelled. Ramming the plane, that did happen. If you have a mid-air collision at those speeds, that force, uh, it's just gonna, it's just gonna be a, a cloud of, of pieces and parts. In that clip, the zero, you know, looks relatively unscathed. That's complete fiction. If you cut off the tail of the plane, the plane's not gonna spin out of control. It's just basically gonna fall straight down because the tail gives it its stability in pitch.
a few too many uh, airplanes for a Navy fighter squadron at that time, but what they're doing, they're, they're dropping their external fuel tanks. So uh, to try and maximize range, you would carry uh, external fuel tanks uh, that you would jettison once you made contact with the enemy because they gave you extra gas, but they're gonna slow you down. They're extra drag and extra weight. Pretty unrealistic attack run. It's not a dive bomber. You know, typically the kamikazes were coming in at, you know, a lower angle. For him to pitch up like that, uh, call it a pop-up attack, at the top of the apex, you know, when you uh, pitch over and, and dive back down, you're pretty slow right there at the at the peak when you're pitching over and, and extremely vulnerable because you're, you're going so slow. Usually for the kamikaze guys, they're going to come in low and they're going to stay fairly low. Or they're going to start off higher and just have all the extra energy to do that dive uh, to begin with, but not do a kind of a pop-up and diving attack. They've got, you know, a couple very small attention to detail of the brass shell casings coming out, but everything else just uh, pretty terrible. Uh, I give it about a 1.5. St. Paul's Cathedral there and Battle of Britain, you know, those high altitude dogfights were leaving contrails that were just swirling masses over the skies that were visible by people of London and the English countryside. It was kind of unique in, in warfare to, to watch these dogfights going on uh, overhead. <laughs> You know, if you take a hit in the engine, oil starts spewing out, covering the, the windscreen, that is, uh, that's pretty real. You don't have windshield wipers, so you're just kind of stuck with a black screen in front of you. That's a really good job showing what it's like bailing out of a World War II fighter. You know, you slide the canopy back, unhitch your, your, your harness. That guy's got a line twist. You can't plan for that. Uh, but that was a, a minor malfunction, and he's he's uh, kind of bicycle kicking his legs to try and get a kind of a gyroscopic effect uh, to unwind the the parachute riser. So that's that's extremely realistic. One of the greatest things about this movie was how many airplanes they used. The fact that they used real airplanes, uh, it was one of the greatest parts about this movie. They joked that they were one of the world's largest air forces when they did this. This is one of the best ones out there. I give this a solid nine. Go get him, little friends. That's accurate. The bomber guys called the fighters little friends. Although the fact that they have P-51s, P-51s weren't in combat in uh, at this point in 1943. They came along a lot later. The Americans operated in a four-ship formation. You still got that mutual support. You'd be in a flight of four aircraft with two elements or two sections, each one with a you know a lead and a and a supporting wingman. So that that's pretty accurate. So this we would call a high aspect merge, where you go head to head and uh, merge with the enemy. A head on shot like that, again, is a really difficult shot. Uh, those fighters are very small, and to try to hit those targets at those closing speeds are, are pretty difficult. But when they show them merge and the, and the Mustangs kind of go up and engage them, uh, that's, that's pretty good. And they're in a loose enough formation that they can, you know, the wingmen are able to keep sight of lead, but also engage uh, the enemy themselves as opposed to just, just flying tight formation. Fighters aren't really flying that close. Uh, you have to do that just for, you know, cinematography purposes to get both aircraft in the frame. Tail gunner, what's wrong? I'm running out of ammo, Cap. I'll take care of it. And this is where it departs from reality. There is no way that the co-pilot would leave his seat, you know, in combat and go take the place of, of a tail gunner. I got him. I got him! <laughs> But the fact that you can't control when a, when a plane, you know, goes out of control, that it might, you know, fly into a, a, another aircraft or a bomber like that, um, stuff like that did happen. So, again, when you have that many airplanes in, uh, in that, uh, you know, relatively small piece of sky, stuff happens. I'd probably give it uh, about a seven and a half. I'd say my favorite World War II dogfight movie is probably the Battle of Britain. They're using real airplanes and telling a, a pretty accurate story. If you enjoyed this video, click the link above for more.